God sent his Son. testify to the light so that all might believe through him. He himself was not the light, but he came to testify to the light. The true light which enlightens everyone was coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him, yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to those who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of the flesh or of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and lived among us, and we have seen his glory, the glory as of a father's only son, full of grace and truth. Gospel of the Lord. Israel in Babylonian captivity began to wonder whether their God had failed. His temple had been destroyed, his anointed king sent into exile along with his people. But we also heard how hope was reborn in the promise of the Messiah who would deliver the exiles. Today, we hear from Isaiah's prophecy a messenger who comes to bring good news of the return of God to Zion. Good news that will be heard, Isaiah says, throughout the whole world. That good news is the good news of the Messiah, the good news of Christmas. As always on Christmas Day, we have set before us two of the densest text in the entire New Testament. The prologue of John's Gospel and the first chapter of the book of Hebrews. It's concentrated, distilled Christology. From pre-existence to incarnation to rejection and glorification, but also receiving and believing. Just as the way that God delivered his people in the coming of the Messiah was greater than the exiles in Babylon could see, So the way God sends the Messiah, and who the Messiah is, the Christ, 
is more than Mary and Joseph and those shepherds who we heard about last night could possibly see. John starts where Genesis starts. The opening phrase is the same, en arche, in the beginning. In the beginning, God created, says Genesis. In the beginning was the Word. These two fit together. For in Genesis 1, God creates by speaking the world into existence. God said, and it was so. This is God's Word. The, the rational principle of the existence of the whole cosmos and God's presence in action. A performative word that does what it says. That's the kind of word this is. And not only is this word with the God who speaks the word, this word, we are told, is God. That what God is, the Word is. As the prologue goes on, we hear that this Word has light in it, and that that light is the life of human beings. And we hear that this Word, God's Word, is also the Father's Son. So we really shouldn't speak of the word with the pronoun it, but with the pronoun he. Because this is the one who comes at Christmas. Arius was wrong when he said in his famous maxim, there was when he was not. This son, born the tiny baby of Bethlehem, is not part of the creation. He's the creator, through whom, as Hebrew says, God created the world. That's the word. That's the Son. And this is crucial to understanding who Jesus is, to have an orthodox understanding of who Jesus is, as opposed to a heretic like Arius. <laughs> because, you see, if, if Jesus isn't God, then he really can't save us. Right? I mean, it takes a God to be the kind of savior that we need. The kind of savior that the prophets promised. And St. John means his entire gospel to be read in light of that very first verse. That in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The words and actions of Jesus Christ are the words and actions of God. If that is not true, then John's Gospel is blasphemous. The Word has been present from the very beginning, even as God spoke in many and various ways through prophets and messengers to his people in all of their difficulties and circumstances. Finding ways to save them, to save us, over and over again in ways that we could never have seen or even imagined or dared dream. Look at what he does. He descends into the creation. At Bethlehem, this one through whom God created the worlds enters into the creation. 
and not as some sort of magnificent Superman, but in the ordinary way as a baby. The womb, the birth canal, the swaddling, the crying, the nursing, the way babies come into them. That is how this God enters into the world. John puts it simply at the end of the prologue. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. God himself became like us, became one of us. Because if Jesus is not truly a human being, then he can't save us. It has to be both. If he's not God, he can't save us. If he's not man, he can't save us. The ancient maxim says, what is not assumed is not saved. Jesus has to assume all of our humanity. Yet through it all, in ways that we can't see or even really imagine or dare dream, he remains God. And this is why what comes into the world through him is this light that John talks about. A light that is the life of human beings, a light that is the true enlightenment of all of us because it comes from the creative word and banishes the darkness of sin and ignorance all the things that cause us to go off the path all the time. Me, every day. I don't know about you. I actually kind of do. Because we're all humans. <laughs> no one has lived without sin except Jesus because he is the Word made flesh. The docetists were wrong when they said that God would not lower himself in this way. God could not, some of them said, leave his realm of the heavens, the perfection, and come into the, the grit and nastiness of this world to save us. Why would God do that? This God does. For a fairly simple reason notwithstanding the fact that this word, this light, this life is pervasively rejected in the world and has been for 2,000 years. To those who receive him and believe in him, he gives this life, which is not just a mere enlightenment, but the fullness of the life that we dream of in our best moments and that we actually kind of fear in our worst moments. A life that unites us with God and with our fellow human beings in a kind of a love and a kind of an intimacy that really only the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit know to perfection. That's what it means when it says he gives us power to become children of God. It means that we are invited into God's household. We're invited into a life, an eternal life. As we know in John's Gospel, eternal life begins now. It begins when we receive Jesus and believe. And that's good news to all the exiles, to all the sinners, to all the people who are living in the grit and nastiness of this world, in other words, to all of us, that the one who in the beginning was with God, in the beginning was God, has entered into our world 
and offers to enter into our lives. And to give us a life with the Holy Trinity evermore and evermore. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.